the Koi Gig Pod on Off the Ball in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Katie McCabe, a huge, huge goal. I'm very proud of the team's performance. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig Podcast. I am Kathleen martin and we are going to take you through not a whole rake of games that happened over the weekend, but we do have two very exciting FA Cup semifinals to look back on, which means that for the first time in ages, we are finally going to have a different name on a trophy in England other than Arsenal, Chelsea or Manchester City, which is very exciting. And then, of course, as well, we did have the WSL game between Arsenal and Bristol where there was lots of goals for us to reflect on and another uh, sad performance for Bristol City to say the very least. But joining me to look through all that, we have, as ever, Captain Karen Duggan and in a very special treat, Emma Carroll is going to join us for the entire podcast. Emma, welcome. How are you feeling about being here from the very start with us? (laughs) Uh, Scared? Um, No, listen, I was watching the games anyway. There's only one WSL game, so couldn't really have a team in a week out. It's so. a weekend off for you as things go. Yeah, well, I was settled down to watch the Spurs Leicester game, and then realised, oh, it's not on BBC Two Northern Ireland, which is on. <laughs> it was on in the UK, and then I was like, okay, I'll flip on the FA Player. It's audio only on that, so it's a <laughs> highlight deal for that game. <laughs> well, we we're very glad to be fair. It's a long match. Yeah, Tottenham in the FA Cup seem to like to do things a long way around, which doesn't bode too well for the final against Manchester United. Karen, things are looking rosy for you for once. I know, I couldn't wait for the podcast this week. (laughs) It's been a while. It's been a minute since I could come on and just be like, positive things to say about Man United. Let's go. Because even last week when I think it was The Athletic had the news that Mark Skinner was going to get a contract renewal and I saw that and I was like, surely not. And then the result came at the weekend, which probably just gave United even more of a backing in saying, okay, we're going to keep him. Because there were were some protests before the start of the game. I think uh, whenever Rachel Williams' name came up on the team sheet, a lot of fans were really unhappy around the stadium and it started up some Skinner out chants and I was a bit harsh on Williams. Yeah, I, I mean, I get the Skinner out kind of, there's been a bit of that rumbling for for a while now just based because United didn't kick on this year, but that's down to who they sold and who they signed. So there's more than the manager involved in that. It's to do with backing and stuff like that. Now, not Skinner's biggest fan in in the world but I wouldn't put that on him starting Rachel Williams who has literally dug us out of holes for the past I don't know how many seasons with her headed goals and what happened in the game (laughs) headed goal like I didn't see that one as a an issue given United's game plan which was to be dogged and solid and give up possession and know that you're not going to get a huge amount of chances but when you do have someone who is probably more prolific, I know she has less goals than Nikita Paris, but she's she's more prolific in the box and she's physically more imposing, which was what United's game plan really was all about. It was all about frustrating um, Chelsea. Um, so the interview, one of the interviews with Skinner after the game and what I, I was glad was that he recognised that there is a, a gulf between Chelsea and United as two footballing outlets, that it is... United, it was all about United out of possession and that he built his team based on the fact that they would be out of possession. And I actually thought that that was the right way to approach the game. It's not pretty, but it's the first time it's ever been effective against Chelsea. So as a fan, I don't care what it looks like. It's Mm. about the result. He was listening to Eileen Gleeson over the last two weeks talking about uh, being comfortable outside of possession and learn some lessons from it and actually worked how to break down a tough midfield like Chelsea, Emma. Mary Earps was kind of saying the same thing though, wasn't she? After the game as well, it's the grittiest win that they've had all season, but one that they needed to turn their season around. So I think that summed it up perfectly really in one more that was very gritty, but they just needed to fight and they did. And I think Garcia as well probably 
sums that up perfectly like her work rate is just insane yeah I'm a big fan of her of hers I know like we talk about the, the losses we've had but I always think she gives that energy but what was different this time was like yeah the likes of Ella Toon sacrificing her game like she doesn't want to be running around plugging up spaces she wants to be on the ball but that wasn't the game for it and when she did get the ball picked a absolutely sublime pass um, and it was yeah it was just it was all about work rate there was some luck Obviously, along the way, I think big. The, I know there. Were, Emma Hayes was saying that there should be two penalties. I think it was one. I think the handball was the closest one. I think the other one there was no actual contact. Um, it, it was a swipe for the ball. She missed the ball, but I don't think she made contact with the player in any meaningful way either. So I, maybe that's my red tinted glasses that I have on there. But I do think the handball maybe. Well, oh, Did Letizia push on Ramirez as well, maybe? Possibly. Good defender. Good defender. <laughs> she, she, needs, she could have been a little bit more subtle about it, but Ramirez is, you know, she's so strong and stuff. I, yeah. I think the fact that Ramirez mm, still had the effort on goal played in Letizia's favour in that one. If she hadn't made contact and it was just a blatant push, I think, yeah. Mm. But, that thing, you know, she's just maybe a type of player that, you know, it's like, no, I'm not going to go down. But then it's just encouraging players to go down in the box. Yeah, we don't want that. Call for we it, need though, that you know? creeping into the game. There's enough of that on the other side. You especially don't want that creeping into Ramirez's game, considering how good and how dangerous she already is. If she can add that to her game where she is willing to go down and make it look like it's a penalty, then. People are going to genuinely fail her an awful lot next season anyway. So I think that's that. <laughs> Yeah, there'll yeah, be plenty yeah. penalties in our future. We got away with a couple of things there, but that's oh, a nice, it's a nice stuff to look forward to. Yeah, <laughs> I needed that this weekend. I needed that. <laughs> you did. Well, I was kind of trying to be nice by leading off United before mentioning anything about your own weekend, Karen. But uh, yeah. go away, are doing great. I, <laughs> your old pal, Sian Russell, is doing very well. <laughs> She's doing a bit too well, considering we have to play them the week after next. Um, but do you know what? I'm not going to win the league. I want her to win it. So <laughs> <laughs> a win for one is a win for all. I'm taking that approach this year. Um. In our own game, obviously, Piment against Athlone. Athlone were the winners. I think that the depth that they have in their squad is really good. I, I know that they've dropped a few points that they wouldn't have expected to this season, but I think themselves, Galway, huge, huge shouts for contenders. Um, and I think Rovers holding shells away was a big a big result because you know Rovers aren't exactly stacked in terms of depth of squad either and at the start of the season everyone was talking about the depth in the Shelburne squad um, but maybe they haven't quite gelled <laughs> they did quite well against us but um, I think that was a big result for Rovers themselves that I think they'll back themselves when they get back to Tala and that one and their their season might grow in confidence now because obviously they've had a lot of draws but um, that was that was a big result as well um, yeah Told you, Galway's ones to watch. You did say this. I feel like we should clip it up and just have it ready for the end of the season because you did say in the couple of weeks in the lead up that they were going to be the ones to be. And actually, you were kind of the only person I saw properly calling that. A lot of people were pointing shells. If, as if the... people had watched our game against them at the end of last season, I was um, I was six. I was watching it on the bench, and it, they're very, they're very impressive. They're a very impressive outlet in terms of just that youth that they buy. They're totally bought into what they're being um, trained. They have no fear. And they have an awful lot of talent. So um, great start for them. Um, so happy for Julie. Mm. Not so happy for myself. But... <laughs> Here we go. You've grown as a person though, Karen, that you're able to say that. If this had been this time last year, I don't think you'd even want to be talking to us right now. We'd be getting I'm over. completely faking my positivity here. <laughs> I hope that you can feel that through the, the medium of podcast. But um too early in the season to be getting too down on things. We've again, we're still only getting players back from injury. Hoping that that'll turn things around. So Watch just for the table for if people want to look at it, uh, we have Galway. They're ahead by five points at the moment, which is quite impressive on 12. Then you've Athlone on seven, Shells and Piedmont on six each. And then Treaty coming in behind at five, which is a really good year for them so far. 
Wexford rock bottom, which is a difficult start for them considering the history that, that they have as a club. Yeah, it is. It's um, a tough time for them. I think obviously they have a lot of talented players, but every team goes through a phase of, of a rebuild. And I think that that's probably going to be coming for Wexford. You know, Piment had to do it. Um, before we joined back they had a, a good few tough seasons there and then they started to compete for titles and it was only about five years ago then we got first silverware and it, it, it ebbs and flows and the uh, the landscape has changed It what you can offer to players makes a massive difference now and that wasn't a feature before Um, so it's going to become more and more prominent as the years roll on so that's why it's great to see Galway in the mix as well because Galway aren't one of those big hitters in terms of the finances that they can mm. they can bring so um, yeah maybe there's there's another bolter this season we were the bolter last season but I think the team is going to take a lot of twists and turns we've we've seen a lot of unexpected results this year and again because there's so much turnover it's really hard to predict it'd be kind of good though if there was another team that bolted in the way that you did and then going into the season afterwards, then again, we're throwing another name into the melting pot as who's going to be competitive, even if it's not like a season long thing. If it's up until the final couple of days, it will definitely add to the general excitement around the league. Um, And everything just seems to be building. I mean, I watched the Camogie on Sunday, the league final, and yeah. it was great to see the crowds coming in after, for before the Meet Dublin game, but also catching a little bit of Tipperary and Galway. So, Women are doing great for themselves around the place. And of course, the Irish rugby team on Saturday as yeah. well. Brilliant. Good weekend for the girls. It was a very good weekend for the girls. We'll, we'll, we'll wear the skorts for another few years and uh, <laughs> come back to the drawing board. How do you feel about the skorts actually, Karen? Because I know it's not football, I mean, but you're, I, you're a dual player. I think it's ridiculous that the motion was voted against. I personally don't mind wearing a skirt. They're very different now from when I first started playing and we used to have safety pins and they were like almost like a cardboard material but they kind of you kind of feel like shorts now O'Neill's have, have done a great job with redesigning that um, but of course players should have the choice if someone is more comfortable in a pair of shorts it has no impact on the game in any way this is the thing I, I would probably continue understand. I would probably continue to wear a skirt but if my teammate wants to wear shorts let them I, I I know there's a thing about uniform and stuff like that, but it, I'm probably the anomaly where I'd continue to wear a skirt if my whole team were wearing shorts. I'm not going to have a problem wearing shorts either. And also, like, if they're all the same colour and you're all running fast, like, no one's really going to make a <laughs> difference. Anyway. The only time you'll notice it is in, like, pre-match photos, probably. And even then, that's hardly a reason Who when like, the majority of an institution and a players have said, actually, no, we would prefer this other option, if that's okay. Or it's just a bit embarrassing because it's backwards, you know. It yeah. just... But the fact as well that there's been like not one single person who's been able to come out out of the like, what was it, 65% that voted for it, for, sorry, voted against it to say, this is why I voted this way yeah. or this is why I decided to go against what the majority of players Because there's no reason. Like I like wearing the skirt. I have no problem with the skirt, but I would have voted to allow the choice. <laughs> yeah. There is no reason for it. Um, oh. It's one of those ones where you kind of just want to bang your head against a wall. Like I never played camogie in my life. There's not even a camogie team near me in Sligo. But when I saw this, I was like, it doesn't make any what? sense. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, anyways, we'll go back to the football. You know what else we should care about this week, guys? Emma Hayes reciting poetry in her pre-match press conferences. Emma, I see you shaking your head there. I I know she like it's obviously a tough run in to the final couple of games, losing out County Cup, now out the FA Cup, the whole thing with Jonas Eideval. But it just seems like she's gone a little bit off piece and I don't really know what's happening. <laughs> it's just starting to unravel a bit. It's like, what's going on here? It's like it's like she's kinda of gone, I'm off, so I'm just gonna, you know, do what I want here for the last couple of months. Yeah, I don't know. Like, is it a pressure? Is it I was about to win a quadruple two weeks ago and then all of a sudden she's second in the league and has to play Barcelona in the Champions League and she's now lost the Conti Cup final out of the FA Cup. Oh, yeah, it's just 
I don't know. I feel like uh, Chelsea and Liverpool men are starting to go the same way. It's like, why did these managers announce that they were leaving so soon? Because I think they were fighting and fighting and fighting and the pressure. And now it's just like, they're all just so tired and they're just dropping left, right and centre. It's crazy. Yeah, I've seen so many people over the weekend making that comparison between Liverpool men and Chelsea women. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not here for the poetry. Um, no. Yeah, I mean most respect in the world for for Emma Hayes but she's the utmost professional and it's just it's just drawing more attention to maybe she wants to draw attention to off-field matters as opposed to maybe a little dip in form that's happening on-field um but <laughs> not for me but even the anecdotes I listened back to the press conference after I saw a couple of people talking about it online saying it was a bit weird and even the anecdote about her son and the you know you if the te- you go to the teacher and you say you don't mean aggression with aggression all that sort of stuff it just also didn't really make a whole lot of sense and then the fact that she just refused to provide any clarity <laughs> as yeah. to what she was trying to say it's very un Emma Hayes she normally goes into those situations with something very clear that she wants to say and generally kind of will front up if she has got something wrong or if not she'll play it off a little bit whereas this she seemed a little bit lost and then with the way the game I think she still backs what she I think she still backs her reason I think so too for her her response and she doesn't want to say well I want I was right to push it like Mm -hmm. because of because you can't say that because like you say you don't meet aggression with aggression but yeah I think without saying it, she still backs what she did. So she's just giving us all these cryptic sort of ways of saying that she was right rather than actually coming out and saying it. Yeah. Much, yeah. I think that probably is the yeah. case as well. It's just disappointing too that she wouldn't see that it wasn't right. In the end, I kind of thought on reflection, she would go, oh, look, heat of the moment. I respect the onus, blah, 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 blah. She doesn't though. Unless something no. else happens. She didn't want to say that because she doesn't. <laughs> uh, well, it was a difficult day for Chelsea at the weekend anyways. Emma, how do you uh, lift a team from this situation? You know, Barcelona in the Champions League, as you were saying, still a couple of crucial WSL fixtures coming up. I think you're the wrong Emma to be asking because I think Emma Hayes is one <laughs> that needs to do that. <laughs> I just wonder, they were looking fine, but I just wonder, is it the loss of Millie Bright and Sam Kerr finally starting to show the leadership, the commanding, how commanding Millie Bright is at the back because I just don't think Buchanan has it. I think it's a couple of times Jess Carter had to bomb back to cover her. Um, and then, yeah, just not... Like, although Chelsea were on top, they didn't seem to have any clear-cut chances apart from the Lauren James shots. And you just, you just wonder if Sam Kerr is on the pitch. Do, does one of those get put away? Hmm. Does Jonas Eidevel throw the final game against City to make sure that they, Chelsea don't win the league and he can give, give Emma Hayes a proper send-off for their big fiery matchup that they have had over the last couple of seasons. I am saying that kind of facetiously. I don't think you should ever throw a match. You, you might not need to. <laughs> That's true. I mean, Arsenal, Arsenal are going to, like after yesterday's win, I mean, Arsenal are pretty much guaranteed that Champions League spot, but they'll want a, a strong end to the season to... Mm-hmm. I do think it rolls into the following season um, for a team like Arsenal who, you know, finishing with the Conti Cup wasn't exactly what they would have put on their vision board at the start of the year. So it's important that they finish strong and if they can stop someone winning the title, it shows that they're still contenders, which could happen in the the City game. Oh, I guarantee when I like reflect on this season, I will look back on it as a general failure for Arsenal mm. that they didn't push on a little bit more whenever City got their big injuries, whenever Chelsea got their big injuries. I know a lot of those players on the Arsenal side are just coming back into the squad after having missed a lot of time out, but I still think there was enough. I think there was enough depth there this year there. compared to other years. There was enough depth there to mm. still be in it for longer. Like we feel like they're out of it and still a bit to go you know 
yeah, this should still be challenging. And also that missing out on that Champions League spot so early on, that was massive for me. It felt like before anything other than winning the league would have been a failed season, I think, for me after dropping out of the Champions League. And then when that became very clear early on, it wasn't going to happen. You just rubbed it off a little bit, Mm. at least from an Arsenal perspective anyways. Although I will enjoy the fact that we did beat Bristol City 5-0 yesterday and uh, Katie McCabe's assist for the fifth goal. That was her 36th in the history of the WSL, which puts her ahead of Karen Carney on the all-time list. And only Beth Mead with 45 has directly provided more WSL goals. So Irish girls waving that flag once again. Not bad for a left back slash right back slash wing back slash wherever she's been playing. (laughs) Yeah, no, she's she's still on the ball. She's still a huge player for Arsenal. Um, I think yesterday's game uh, just the epitomizes the gulf between the, the top sides and the sides that are coming up, and how hard it is for a team to come into the WSL and try and play a brand of football that's not going to be completely defensive and, and sacrificing a bit of identity. Um, you could call Bristol City brave. You could call them naive, but Arsenal were, were good on the day. So much joy down the left hand side. Um Ford was, you know, she was on her game yesterday. So yeah, it was a really tough day for Bristol. You guys know my love for Bristol, and I did feel a little bit bad watching it. I won't lie. I want yeah, it's I want them. we're preventable as well, you know, sloppy passes. I think the goalkeeper could have done better for a couple of them. They're things that on another day they do get saved and the scoreline isn't as damning, but that probably was a reflection of how the game went. Mm. That's the thing with Bristol as well, because they can put in really brave performances and they get outdone by a goal or two in the end, whereas that just wasn't it. It was a bottom of the table. Yeah. Versus I would say the they've table. conceded yeah. about 56 or so mm. goals this season. I think it's yeah, so... I think Russo and Mead both could have had hat tricks as well. Like they really. Yeah. 53 and goals. Kim Little as well probably could have had a goal as well so it could have been like, like 7 or 8 <laughs> mm. well oh well I'll, I'll take a few run-ins for yeah. the next couple of weeks anyways to make myself happy and we should one thing we- that was very upsetting from that game and I don't know if anybody noticed was Katie McCabe's untucked shirt <gasps> like oh. what was that about I hope this is not a new look for it uh... somebody called the police yeah because it's like a I was looking and I was like, I'll give her a couple of minutes. Maybe she'll fix it. Maybe it just came out in a tackle or something. I was like, no, she hasn't. There's no, no, just been made, being made here. Love the idea. We okay. hit the hard topics on this podcast. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> when something is so iconic. Yeah. I can genuinely guarantee of all the things we talk about in this podcast, that 10 seconds of Emma saying <laughs> that Katie Cave shirt was untucked will be the thing that is the most popular out of the whole. <laughs> And all our other excellent analysis on the weekend's football will go straight out the window. <laughs> but it's not pay attention to the good stuff, all right? <laughs> you do, in fairness. Yeah, like... I didn't cop it. <laughs> uh, you are a good woman, though, for noticing if a shirt is tucked in or not, Emma. I feel like you're one of the people who kind of, you know, you like a little bit of formality in these things. I did because I double glanced then because I checked Leah Williamson and I was like, yeah, no, it's definitely untucked because <laughs> Leah is also another tucked in short kind of gal so sorry this is why we need you on the podcast more often <laughs> this is the hard hitting analysis that we need uh we should briefly touch on the other uh fa cup final i know it was a little bit difficult to watch if you were on the side of the water but spurs once again making an absolute meal of this it should have been finished so much earlier martha thomas eventually winning it for them with two minutes of added time left uh kind of got a feel for grace clinton in this situation going into the final being so good for united now so good for spurs and not gonna get her moment in wembley it's awful isn't it like, yeah, it probably is probably Spurs' most important player. Like, and oh. she was instrumental to everything. I thought her and Naz was com- a nightmare for for Leicester yesterday. Um, the I, the only thing I'm disappointed in is like you look at these pairs when you're on loan, and you're like, come back, come back. What are we doing? Like, you know, when United don't have, well, I don't think there's a huge amount of depth there. Um, 
you look at the performances that she's been put in, but maybe again, it's the kickstart she needs and maybe she can be a big player for United next year, but you do feel for her in this situation, having been so crucial for Spurs. Um, but I'm happy. <laughs> you would rather not see her line up against you? Yeah. I want to win. <laughs> I should do the FA Cup final last year. I want United to win. I, again, it, like yesterday, it wasn't about the football. It's just about the results. And this is the game. Mm. How confident are you feeling going in against the Spurs team who can be incredibly Spursy? Still not confident because I wouldn't call them Spursy. I'd call them unpredictable. And they're a team that, you know, have changed the way they played and probably have that capability. They can all go all out attack. They can go all out defense. I don't really know what way they're going to go. Um, kind of have the fear that it's written in the stars for Martha Thomas to come and pop up and get a winner. Um, that would be an absolute nightmare, especially considering we don't feel like we have an out and out striker. Um, but if you were to obviously choose at the start of the season that this would be your FA Cup finalist opponents, um, you'd be surprised and you would probably take it. I think that the monkey is kind of off United's backs now. You just hope that they don't feel uh, that there's, I don't think there should be any complacency. I feel like the hunger is going to be there to get a trophy to the club. Um, but yeah, it's all on the mm-hmm. day really in these kind of things, isn't it? You know, they, they ran Chelsea close before, but, you know, getting over the line in a final it's all about mentality. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Well, you had the 4 0 win, was that December? And that was away for United. And then United and Spurs are actually playing each other this weekend in a very funny turn of events. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see will there be much difference in how the two teams line up or how they have played from the weekend? If there'll be like a little bit of mind games going on with each other? I think there will be. Has, I, I don't think. I feel like they need, both of them know where they are in the table now. Like you have a trophy on the line, but at the end of the day, there's loads of time to do all their homework that they need. But I do think that it will be a little bit different. Oh, you have to, if you want to be a big club or, you know, have that big club mentality, you kind of have to do a bit of the, you know, playing. mind games yeah. and having a bit of fun with it and talking about it in the build up or trying to psych out your opponents because otherwise you're, kind of admit not admitting defeat going in but there I is a, bit a of win, win is important though because it gives you the confidence I think mm. if, like if either team could get a big win over the other team I think it gives gives a lot of confidence going into the game individually as a player you feel like you can back yourself against the team what happens in terms of tactics or what happens on the day is different but going into the game as an individual I feel like you could be a bit more relaxed no, I would agree with that. Because you would feel if United get another big result, then that's twice they've beaten Spurs this season mm-hmm. in a big fashion. If Spurs get a result, it's going in all evens into the final. So mm-hmm. either way, it's... I mean, it's going to be a good storyline one way or the other because of the fact that it's two teams that haven't ever been there. Well, I know you... Sorry, United have been in it, but haven't won it. And then Spurs have never been there before. Yeah, And it'll be the first time since 2005 that a different team lifts the trophy just to show how much time has changed that time it was Charlton beating Everton 1-0 to win the Cup and then first time in a decade so Liverpool's 2014 title in the WSL that was the last time that a club that isn't Arsenal, Chelsea or City will win a major women's trophy in England and between those three clubs they've won 27 in a row titles which is pretty insane boring (laughs) (laughs) it is boring and like that's why it'd be so brilliant to see a different club now if Spurs win it it'll probably be far more shocking in my mind than if United win it I would have thought even with you know how United have played this season they would be the ones that you'd expect a little bit more but it's the beauty of the cup you just don't know what's going to happen exactly um, we should wrap by mentioning this is news that was announced last week before we had recorded or just after we had recorded but we now have officially a new head of women and girls football in Ireland so Hannah Dingley she is coming over from English side Forest Green Rovers people will remember her name because she was the first woman to ever take over a pro English club 
Um, so she came in after Duncan Ferguson. The fact Duncan Ferguson ended up there is still one of the most insane things I've ever heard. If people don't know this club, they're vegan. They're really into their environmental side of things, like quite progressive in a lot of the ideas that they have. And Duncan Ferguson is just such a funny character to put into the <laughs> middle of that. The guy, if you were to epitomize someone who just looks like he loves a great steak, that would be Duncan <laughs> Ferguson. But anyway, she took over as interim manager. That's a little sidetrack for me. Mm. I am also roasting a chicken in my kitchen at the moment. Yeah. And I think that's why I went on the steak round. Um, she was working there as academy manager when she was an interim manager. Been there since 2019. Have been linked to Shamrock Rovers as their academy head, but they went with uh, Simon Field from Carlisle United instead. So she is going to be our new head of women and girls football some nice quotes from her talking about how much she does want to grow the game. I'm not totally sure if she has other links to Ireland, just the fact that she was linked to Shamrock Rovers as well, but she is a UEFA pro license holder and has a couple of degrees in coaching and in sports and exercise. And we will hopefully be chatting to her in the coming months when she has settled into the role a little bit more, but it's nice to have someone in the role to get the ball rolling again after Eileen left. Yeah. um, And I hope she's ready to hit the ground running because essentially we've been without someone for months and I don't think that that should have happened at such a pivotal time where we spoke about how important it is to capitalise on the recent successes of the international team. She sounds like she's ready for the job, like she's good good to get in. Um, coach and stuff is brilliant. It shows that she has a great understanding of the game, but I think there's more to this role than the coach and it's really about development, business development, grassroots development, all that sort of stuff. So um, it's great to have someone who has credentials in the role and someone who's ready to like really dig their teeth into it and see it as an exciting opportunity because it is. Um, it took us a while. The FAI wouldn't be quick to fill roles. So um, no, it's great to have have someone in place. Hopefully she'll get a relationship with not only Eileen, but the people who run the league the the underage structures and and really start to grow them because I still feel like there's that gap between 18 to 22 I think that needs Mm. to be plugged you know possible home-based under 21 team linking in with colleges I feel like there's so much work to be done I don't know how much support she's going to get I don't know what the plan is but it's great to have someone to spearhead any type of improvements because that's what we need now we need to improve Definitely. And especially with the news um, on Monday that Jonathan Hill is leaving his position. And now the FAI are looking for another role. We still don't have a men's manager. We're actually very fortunate that we have He'll probably be put role. into the interim CEO role or something now, watch. Like, oh, <laughs> probably, yeah. who knows? Maybe it's actually Jonathan Hill. The big announcement is supposed to come this week is he's actually going to take over as men's manager. And that's why he is leaving his post. Uh, yeah, it's been a chaotic few months, to say the least, for the FAI. So it's good to have someone in the role good to have someone who has that background and working with academies so they are used to the development side and reaching out to colleges and dealing with schools and all that sort of thing and hopefully we will watch on with interest to see what happens and as I said hopefully we'll be chatting to her in the next while as well so we'll get to see what her plans are for women and girls football here but for now Karen and Emma thank you very very much for joining as per usual it was a pleasure and I look forward to doing it all again next week with you both. If you want to get in touch with us, you can get us on Twitter at the Koi Gig Pod or on X, if that's what the kids are calling it these days. I think it'll always be Twitter in my mind. Um, the Koi Gig Pod on Off the Ball is brought to you by Cabri, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you all again next week. The Koi Gig Pod on Off The Ball in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team.